Hey, this is John Rocker, former closer of Atlanta Braves. Uh, I will be coming up on the next episode of I Only Touch Greatness. Yeah. The mayor of C Town, Ryan Hayes, <laughs> and his big name guest. The closer continues to get it done. He's perfect in the postseason. In the six games he's pitched in, he has picked up three saves. Vancouver's best show with Ryan Hayes. Often imitated but never duplicated, I Only Touch Greatness Podcast with Ryan Hayes. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great steaks, great staff. Head over to the John B. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Say hey, sent you. Scan the code and follow. Often imitated but never duplicated, I Only Touch Greatness Podcast with Ryan Hayes. What's up, y'all? How you doing? I'm all right. Is that a Carolina Mudcats hat you're wearing there? Pardon me? Is that a Carolina Mudcats hat you're wearing there? No, just the podcast hat. Oh, I got you. Okay. Okay, sweet. I was kind of scared. I was getting catfished here into... There's so many fake profiles of yours out there on the internet. I'm glad I got no, the right yeah. I, it, it wouldn't. I had to, I had to uh, take the leak and the, the link and transfer it into Chrome. Um, so I, I had a fist fight with it for a second. So perfect. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, how are you doing? I, I do. I do have a question to ask. Yeah. Since we are are broadcasting in Canada, and I get it. You know, um, podcasting all over the world. But do I have to to begin and finish every sentence with a? Eh? Hey, I do that all the time. Eh? Okay. Yeah, I do it all the time. I'll actually, I'll actually come up to uh, to see you, Hosers, in I think July. We're doing a uh, uh, an NPA camp. Um, me and Tom House and a couple of our, our coaches um, in Calgary. Okay. Yeah. See, yeah, I'm in, yeah, I'm in Vancouver. Okay. Yeah, but buddy, my Noah Welch. Uh, Noah was a NHL player for half, probably a dozen years or so. Um, he's got a real nice facility up there, and 
We're going to a pitching clinic up there with him for a couple of days. Oh, have you ever been to Vancouver? Uh, I have, yeah, sure have. Okay, been, good. Been a, been, a, been a long time, but uh, uh, but yeah, I've, I've been there before. Been, been to Calgary a couple of times. Uh, like those places. Okay, perfect. So, might as well get started? Okay, sure. Okay. So, if my stats are correct, born in Statesboro, Georgia, uh, mm-hmm. what was childhood like for you growing up? Uh, uh, I would say nothing, you know, nothing uh, other than typical. Um, you know, I, uh, I only lived in Statesboro for a year. I grew up in, 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 uh, in Macon, Georgia, which is an awesome place. Uh, as you can tell by my sarcasm, um, yeah, actually wasn't, wasn't a bad place to grow up, but, uh, you know, just sports and, uh, trying to do good in school and, you know, get a little old and you start chasing the girls around and then it's done. So there you go. <laughs> about, about the uh, beginning, middle end of it. Okay. And did you play any other sports growing up or was it always just baseball? Uh, no, I actually uh, would would much rather have been a football player. Um, I was just uh, too slow and too white. So, um, <laughs> base, 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 baseball was it. But uh, no, I, I love playing football. I mean, I really did. I, I, I got a couple offers um, uh, to some small schools. So I was a wide receiver to uh, Presbyterian College, Georgia Southern, stuff like that. But uh, you know, I, I had almost a full ride to Georgia. Um, and, of course, got drafted. So, clearly, baseball was the more, the more logical route to go. Uh, at some point, are we going to get the camera to be on you? No, I hate doing that. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 usually, I usually turn it off. It's not going to be hard to turn it off on this one. Okay. Then uh, when did you start taking baseball seriously, and who were your influences growing up? Uh, I would say 14. Um, yeah, yeah, I always seriously love playing. Um, I love watching you know, watch the games. Um, you know, Bacon's about an hour south of Atlanta, so – about four or five times a year would, uh, um, you know, we'll take the trip up to Atlanta to, to old, old Fulton County Stadium and, and watch games. And, and loved, I, I was not the obnoxious kid that would, you know, crowd around the, uh, the dugout trying to get autographs and such. But, uh, um, you know, we love, love, love watch the games. And we'll probably watch, you know, at least 100 games a year. I mean, again, uh, Braves be on TBS back then. I mean, they were on uh, Channel 17 every night. So, uh, used to do a lot of that. But probably, uh, you know, really, really seriously when, when the, the gear change was probably about fourteen. Just got a wild hair up my ass. Uh, I want to be a I want to be a big league ball player, and um, and from that day forward, it, it was something you know probably three hundred plus days a year. I had to be doing something for baseball, whether it was working out or watching a game or reading a book or you know playing or whatever. I had to do something uh, to learn about and get better uh, with the game on a, on a you know pretty much a daily basis. Uh, I can remember um, you know again loving football, and we had a pretty good football team, won a lot of games, and. You know, after most games, most of the you know, the guys would go out and you know cruise around making and you know chase the chickies around. And uh, if that was my workout day, and I hadn't got my workout done yet, uh, then after the football game, instead of going out with the guys, uh, I would go home and and uh, get up in my room and do my 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 stretching routine, my strength and conditioning, uh, you know, baseball specific workout uh, for an hour, hour and fifteen minutes after I got done playing the football game. And um, that's just what had to be done. So I, I couldn't get it done. You know, during the uh, during the day, school, football game, all that. So the only time to do it would have been eleven o'clock on a Friday night, and that's what I did. Um, so yeah, that was it. Was it was probably probably the age of fourteen? I would say. Was there uh, somebody you looked up to and really tried to mirror your game after? Huge Roger Clemens fan. Uh, okay. Very big, big Clemens fan, and as it would work out, I ended up uh, being represented by by Hendrick Sports Management. Um, out of Houston for 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 many years, uh, and that was that was Roger's agent too. So. Uh, ended up getting to, getting to know Roger fairly well, and and I thought it was pretty neat. And my my childhood idol, uh, we had the had the same agent, so uh, I thought that was that was pretty neat. Okay, so you had three perfect games as a high schooler. Were you always a pitcher? Um, uh, and, and center field. Um, I don't I don't have any perfect games. I was I was uh, never a connoisseur of control. Um, I, I think I had three no hitters. Um, oh, okay, that was the stat. I can't see myself going sitting without walking anybody. Okay. If you were having a dream dinner party and you could invite three other famous people, dead or alive, who do you want to come to your party? My dad will be one. Okay. Um, Mick Jagger would be two. Uh, man, hold on. we have got to go with a... Well, my dad's dead, so another dead guy. Um, uh, that pair of so so many to choose from. Uh, 
Hmm. Sandy Koufax. I want okay. to meet Koufax. Yeah, I want to meet Koufax. Okay. So you had originally committed to Georgia. Um, what, what made you cho choose to go pro? John Schultz is a hell of a salesman. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't do myself any favors. Uh, my senior year, uh, I, I did nothing. Of course, had no coaching, no advice, no no instruction. Um, you know, there's something you know, called signability, and, and when the, the scouts are talking to to young players, you know, specifically you know high school players that do have options of college, things like that, um, you know, they're, they're going to make sure that if we draft you, you're going to sign. We're not going to just piss away draft pick on you. And uh, I didn't think I was ready to play pro ball. Uh, I don't think I was good enough just yet. Uh, I always wanted to play at Georgia. Um, you know, in college, I, I think it's still the same today, but back then it was 11.7 scholarships for a whole 25 man roster. And Georgia gave me a 95% scholarship, so basically a full ride to Georgia. And I was like, yeah, that's just where I want to be. And, um, you know, I, I kept telling all you know, I, I would have scouts call my house two, three days a week, and Milwaukee scout or Toronto scout or whomever, uh, you know, uh, about, about two, three times a week. Mom uh, was a Dodger scout on the phone, so I'd go up, you know, up in the room and talk to them. And, and uh, I, I would tell all of them, you know, if you draft me, I want to go to Georgia. I don't think I'm ready to play. I mean, it's really just, just you know, kind of motherfuck myself. Um, you know, looking back now, it should have been, oh, Dodgers I always want to play for the, oh, Brewers, I always want to play for the Brewers. Yeah, that's my favorite team. You know, I should have been saying stuff like that, but uh, I didn't. Um, project to be a top top five round pick and dropped to 17th because of that, uh, I think. And then I had some uh, a labor issue my junior year um, as well. So a little, little bit of injury injury history. And uh, so the Braves draft me. Um, I go on to play you know, American Legion that summer, and John Sherholtz and um, Chuck Lamore, who's assistant GM, they came to almost every one of my starts. They would drive from Atlanta to watch, you know, my fat ass pitch, and you know, a little, little high school baseball field that you know had stands that could hold about a hundred people. And uh, you look up, there's Sherholtz uh, in, in his suit, you know, nagging me, nagging me, nagging me, and uh, I actually ended up going to Athens and uh, going through orientation, get my class schedule, the whole deal. Uh, and about a week before school started, uh, Sherholtz invited me up. Uh, to work out before a game. So I got to go in the clubhouse. You know, this is in 93, so, you know, 91, 92, World Series. Um, uh, I should go on a couple of World Series games. And, I mean, there's Deion Sanders. There's Dave Justice. And there's Sid Bream. Oh, my God. And, you know, you're just, you know, 18-year-old kid. You're like, holy shit, man. And I'm sitting there, you know, in a spare locker getting dressed and taking a shower. And I'm like, wow, this, this is awesome. And, um, you know, got to got to, to, to throw in the bullpen uh, on the field with Leo. And uh, after I – through and worked out and shagged for fly balls and, and all that stuff uh, on, on, on you know, Fulton County Stadium. Uh, went to get dressed. My scout walks in. He's like, yeah, sure. I'll see you in his office. Like, all right. So walked up there and just pushes a contract across the desk. He's like, you're ready to sign this thing now? Yeah. Hmm. All right. Give it to me. Yeah, I'll sign it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it was, it was, you know, I guess tempered jubilation. I'm like, awesome. But, oh, shit, what the hell did I just do? I'm not really ready for this shit, you know? And then another epiphany hit me on the way home. Oh, fuck. I, I, I've got to call Steve Weber up, Georgia's head coach, and tell him, no, school starts next Monday. I ain't going to be there. And you just, you just, you know, give me almost a, a full scholarship. And you know, now, now it's going to be a wait. You're going to play your whole season with only, uh, with only, you know, 10 and a half scholarships. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had, I had to call him up the next day and be like, yeah, coach, uh, I'm not, uh, not going to be there. I'm, 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 I'm signing with Atlanta. So, uh, obviously was, was, uh, was quite pissed. Uh, but then to, to add to the story, what was it? So that was in 93. Uh, so 99, we're playing the, uh, Yankees, the world series. And I'm sitting there, uh, with a few other guys just having a drink at the lobby bar at the, uh, uh the grand Hyatt in Manhattan, tap on the shoulder, turn around Steve Weber, uh, George George's old manager. And, uh, he was uh, actually scouting for the Yankees now. And so we sat there and talked a few minutes. It's like, boy, I was, I was pissed at you. I was like, ah, I guess you made the right decision. I was like, yeah, I think I did. So it kind of kind of came full circle. So did you sign? You didn't sign with Atlanta as a free agent because I found a stat, I think. Uh, there was draft day, and you went 18th round in 93, correct? Mm -hmm. You were yeah. drafted, though, by Atlanta in 1993, right? Yeah. Yeah, eight, 18th round, I had that stat. Um, mm -hmm. Where were you drafted? What do you mean? Like, where were you? Do you remember being? Were you there at the draft? There, oh, they, 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 yeah, they didn't do that back then. No, actually, I was on. Uh, 
uh, at my American Legion baseball practice. Um, okay. And dad, dad never came to practice. Again. Why would he? Uh, and when I see dad's car, you know, rolled up the park, I'm like, oh shit. I'm not, I, was, I know it's, it's, it's draft day. And uh, he comes walking on the fence and meet him over there. He's like, got drafted by Atlanta. And, uh, but he told me this in the, in the, well, 18th round, 17th pick. He told me that. I, I got fucking pissed. I'm like, really? 18th stinking round? He's shitting me. <laughs> uh, I was, I was a little, little upset about that. But, you know, again, I didn't, didn't do myself any favors when I uh, was talking to scouts and you know, literally said, don't draft me. Uh, I'm going to play at Georgia. I mean, what, a, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a stupid way to promote yourself, idiot. Were you, were you pretty happy to be going to the hometown team? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was thrilled. It was Atlanta. And uh, I love my scout named Rob English. Uh, Rob and I had really good rapport. Um, and one thing I was, I was really excited about uh, as well as back then, uh, the A ball team, the Sky League, South Atlantic League, um, uh, was a making Braves. So I knew when I when I played A ball, I would get to you know stay in my parents' house and sleep in my sleep in my uh, my childhood bed and you know, have all my friends around me and all that kind of stuff. So that was I thought was going to be cool. As it turned out, it was not because um, you know every every day I would pitch. Uh, you know, once every five days, I'm leaving thirty tickets. Uh, it was just a royal pain in my ass. Um, I'm sitting there trying to pitch and focus the dugout. And I've got friends sticking their head around. Hey, John, really? Yeah, working here. Can you just a little space? You know, fuck off. Um, so yeah, it was uh, uh, it was kind of working, trying to get the big leagues, but also trying to you know juggle all the social stuff that goes with it. Um, yeah, at twenty years old, of course, at twenty years old, the last time these folks saw you, you were. Throwing no hitters, I think my senior year I gave up six hits the entire year. Um, so they expect me to, you know, still be that guy. I'm like, well, this competition is a little bit better. So uh, uh, I would uh, would take it pretty hard. I wouldn't have a good outing because I'd be all my friends just saw me get my ass kicked and you know go three and a third and give up six. Um, so yeah, it was it was uh, a little bit nerve wracking that I'm uh, trying to trying to throw up numbers and press the Braves, but also trying to, you know, save face for the, the hometown crowd that expect you to go out and, you know, deal every night. Okay. Lots of pressure on you. The, you made your debut in 1998. Uh, describe the feelings of that in you know, your first game, big game. Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to describe. I mean, that's, that's, um, yeah, I, I do remember, you know, the, just the, the journey to get there is just, I mean, just talking about something that fucked with your head. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you have one or two good outings uh, in A-ball and you're riding the bus back from, you know, the, the, the yard or to the next city or whatever. And, and you're sitting there in your own head. You just went seven innings. You gave up three hits and one run, struck out 10, and you're, you're in, your, in your head. You're mapping out your path to the big leagues. Oh, I'm going to do this by the end of this year. Then I'm spring training next year. Then I should be in the big leagues in about a year. And then next start, you go out and you, you can't get out a second. You're like, fuck, I'm going to get released in a fucking week. Um, so it's, it's just a big mental, you know, mental fuck with. Uh, but when you finally get there and just all the ups and downs and the roller coasters and, you know, wanting something so bad, I mean, I, I can't, I can't imagine ever wanting anything that bad ever again. But when you get there and you walk out of that dugout and, uh, you know, smell that ballpark in your nose and, uh, grass under your feet, and you look at that big old cathedral just just rising up around you, and it's just kind of enveloping you. Uh, and you say to yourself, "You can't ever take this shit away from me." The day I die, if I if I get sit down tomorrow, I, the rest of my life, I can say I was a big leader. Um, which you know, at any one point in time, there's only 750 guys on the planet that can say that. Um, and to this day, there's only about 25 or 30 thousand that can say that. Um, you know, from the beginning of baseball, so. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty special, man. Where did the sprinting in from the bullpen come from? That's actually a pretty good story. Uh, I'm playing in Puerto Rico, uh, winter ball down there. And as a starter, I was never, uh, you know, again, you know, one or two good starts, or it was, it, was, it, was, it was one good start, a mediocre start, and then a shit start. And, and it was like that my whole Miley career. I was, I was very average. I had, I, Really good stuff. I was, you know, 93, 95 on the left side with a with a really good breaking ball and changeup, but my, my command was always suspect. And uh was probably a five hundred pitcher with a four and a half ERA, you know, my, my entire uh, entire Miley career. And um all of a sudden in the double A year, I started putting things together. Uh, mentality changed. Uh, I got Bruce Del Camp, my pitching coach, and we made a couple little tweaks and it's amazing the uh, 
the amount of payoff a little tweak will have. I mean, just going from a, a, a curveball to a slot. I mean, just, that just really opens up the zone point. I won't get into the technicalities of it, but, you know, little, little adjustment can, can, can pay off big, uh, in, in the, you know, especially well pitching hitting as well. Um, and, uh, so for whatever reason, uh, into my double A year, I you know, have a great year. I think I had like a four eighty RA uh, into my double A, you know, double A year. I'm not, not exactly, you know, burning the house down. And they're like, we're putting you on the forty man roster, and we're seeing the, the Arizona Fall League. I'm like, no shit. I don't know if you know about the Arizona Fall League. But that's where the, the top five or six prospects uh, in each organization go uh, for the winter. And I think it's like seventy percent of guys that play in the Fall League will play in the big leagues the next year, and, and the Fall League's got three or four guys on each team that, you know, already have some big league time. Um, so I'm like, all right. I mean, you notice my numbers ain't that great. Right. And, uh, for whatever reason, I went to the fall league and just shoved. I mean, I had like a two and a half ERA was uh, in the top five or six in every category ERA and wins and strikeouts and all that. Don't know where it came from. Uh, cause you know, two or three weeks earlier in, in double a, I wasn't, you know, I was, you know, slightly above average. And then uh, get home from the fall league and, and uh, again, you know, face some good, you know, some good players and face some guys that had September call ups and things like that, but never really faced a real stud. Um, you know, I'd face some, some, some big league guys and, and, uh, you know, maybe a ball or high, they got sent down rehab assignments. These guys are, you know, they, they got a busted something and they're down there just trying to get themselves their timing back. Whatever. So they're not, you know, in, in big league form. So you're kind of getting a, a lesser version of themselves. So, you know, technically I'd never faced a, a real, you know, mainstay big leaguer. And um, so I get home to the fall league. That was a long story. I, I can run my mouth all day about baseball. But uh get home to the fall league, and um, my agent calls me up and is like, uh, Braves want you to go to Puerto Rico now, and they want you relief. Uh, clearly, you're not breaking that starting rotation with three side award winners in it. Uh, but there, there are going to be a couple spots in the bullpen. They want, You've never relieved before. I want you to give it a shot so you see how you do. And so I fly down there and, and – uh, and, you know, get up with the team, the uh, Maguas Indios. And I had a good team. I had uh, Jose Valens was on that team. Will Cordero was on that team. Um, I think who else? Ricky Day was on that team. Um, Carlos Beltran was on that team. Yeah, they had a pretty damn good team. And uh, I was there for two or three days. And uh, down in the bullpen, and my coach, Guy Hansen, walks down. And it's like, um, uh, Pudge Rodriguez is due up fourth next inning. If we get to him, you got him. Like, oh, shit, really? Well, this is this is why you're in Puerto Rico. See if you can get guys like Avon Punch Rodriguez out. He just won like his second batting title. You know, five take he only the big leagues like five, six years with a, you know, five straight all star appearances. I'm like, oh fuck, okay. And sure enough, first guy gets on, uh steals second. So I'm like, well, there goes the double play. So I'm probably in. So we start humping it, you know. And uh sure enough, uh two outs, running on second, punch comes up. Manager uh, Tom Gamboa comes out, raises his left hand. Go, Here we go. We're getting ready to find out if I'm fucking good enough. And uh, without even thinking, I just bolted for the mound. Like all these years of hard work preparation, um, I, excuse the expression, I cut here away from the big leagues. And the Braves sent me down here to figure out I can get big league hitters out. And this isn't some chump. This is five time All Star Bud Rodriguez, two time batting uh, champion, silver slugger, the whole thing. And uh, I, like, right, let's figure out, let's, let's see if the last 10 years were worth it. And um, uh, down the hill and punched out Pudge in four pitches, and uh, I think I ran into the dugout faster than I ran from the bullpen to the to the mound. So uh, I was obviously very excited that uh, uh, I just struck out a, a big league stud, my first ever attempt at facing facing a guy that good. So that did you keep the routine just because of that? Uh, it, it wasn't a gimmick, really. Um, I just got that damn fired up to come in games. I, I wanted to come in there and just fucking kick your ass. Just take take my fastball and throw it right through your Louisville slugger. There's nothing the bad of your fucking hand. And some of that was was going back to childhood, just being a, an idol of Roger Clemens's. Um, you know, just 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 being a huge fan of Rogers. And, and I mean, there was a a quote, and actually, uh, I just sent this article around a bunch of my kids, a bunch of my guys I work with, just trying to help their mentality. But it was a great Sports Illustrated article back probably in the late seven ish, eighty six or something like that about about Roger, and he had an awesome quote in there um, that he wanted to come out and throw fastballs and uppercuts, and uh, that that kind of always always stuck with me. Um, and that that just kind of became a mentality. And I think that was one one thing that really set me apart. Finally got me over the hump when, when I was uh, in the, the, the lower minor leagues. I pitched terrified. Um, I just I pitched like an absolute fucking pussy, 
And uh, we just, I mean, I would literally sit there on the mound and like calculate my ERA while I'm on the mound during the game. I get this guy out, my ERA will be below four, and then double the gap to and score. Oh, shit. Now my ERA is like 4.2. I mean, I'm just sitting there living, just, I'm, ter- I'm terrified to fuck up. And, and finally, I guess toward the end of that double A season, I'm like, I am so tired of pitching scares. It's just not fun for me anymore. And, um, you know, just, just went with that. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'm going to force myself to be aggressive, force myself to be a little cocky. Um, you know, act as if, uh, you know, kind of, kind of is the expression. And, uh, the more I did that, the better I pitched. And I'm just, just not, not being afraid all the time. But that, that was sort of a, a byproduct of that rock you're in. Let's go out and fucking just put the Dukes up and start swinging at each other. Let's go. Okay. In 1999, you had a career year, I believe, uh, 38 saves. Uh, what contributed to that? Um, pitching behind three Cy Young Award winners that gave me a lead every night. <laughs> and a damn good team. Um, you know, there was a lot, a lot of contributing factors. I mean, I had a, had a, had a good year. Um, you know, if I was coming to my own, you know, Andrew Jones being in center field, uh, that's, that's, that's one place that uh, I think just really gets overlooked, it, 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 you know, why that, that brave staff did so well. I mean, we would always get, you know, new guys would, would come in from other organizations and, you know, we got so-and-so and, you know, his last three years, he's had a, you know, a 4.6 ERA and comes to us and he's got a 3-2. Oh, Leo Mazzoni gets the credit. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, but having Andrew Jones in center field, he, he would shave a half run off everybody's ERA. I mean, just rockets in the gap. That little, little short, little, little dinking, uh, you know, dying quail, um, he would take it all away. And, you know, I, I can remember time and time again coming in, third day in a row, hanging. You know, it's third day in a row, it's a day game, and I'm tired, arms, arms, you know, arms a little dead, body sore, and first guy I face with a one-run lead just hits a missile, and I'm like, oh, shit, there's a lead-off double. By the time I turn around, there, there and AJ's camped under. I'm like, oh fuck, okay. And, I mean, talking about a shot in the ass of, of a B12 when you think you just gave up a lead off double with a one run lead. Um, you know that that guy's gonna score eighty percent of the time. Uh, and next thing you know, AJ runs it down. You're like, all right, nobody on one out. I was getting ready for runner on second, nobody out. Great. And and then you you just are drilling your way through the rest of that inning. Um, so yeah, I mean, having him and then of course you know, we we played together the minors. Uh, uh, for three years too, um, but uh, I, I really give Andrew a lot of credit for for the numbers that that, that whole staff had. The, so I went and got this jersey back in two thousand. It's totally your jersey and everything. I still wear it to yeah. these days. The, uh, I've been a big fan of you for a well, long, you, long time. Well, thank um, you, brother. I appreciate that. Yeah, big, big fan. And I've been manifesting this for a long time, trying to find a way to get a hold of you. So I used to. You, 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 you know, I, I, I hate doing these things. I can't stand doing them. Well, I mean, I hate doing them. I'm not, not a huge fan. When I when I got you know, stuff to promote, when I had a, a 501c3 for homeless veterans, I did tons and tons and tons of these things. Um, but now I'm you know, just kind of retired, just sort of you know, not doing a whole lot. I don't like to do them anymore. Uh, I, I, I turned out about 90% of them unless I know you personally or whatever. So um, good job manifesting because I ordinarily just don't respond or whatever. So Perfect. I <laughs> you, call, you, call, you, call, you called me in a good mood yesterday. All right. Perfect. The uh, I personally have always hated New York, whether it was the Rangers being my Vancouver Canucks in 94, whether it was Biggie going against my Tupac, I just uh, never was a fan of New York. So when you came out with your Sports Illustrated episode, uh, uh, combo talking about New York, I jumped on your bandwagon and I was riding with you the whole way. Um, do you, you obviously remember that story. Um, uh, did you know it was going to cause such a big deal when you had that interview? Don't even do it. Dude. I'm so fucking tired of talking about that goddamn thing. Yeah, that's that's usually why I don't do interviews. I just, I mean, just that is a de- that is a a horse has been beaten to death. So move on, please. Okay, traded to Cleveland. Uh, what was it like being in a new location? Yeah, I uh, I, I thought I was really going to like it. Um, you know, by by the end there with Atlanta, you know, I went through arbitration the year before and. Uh, 
you know, it's something, is, of course, the team's trying to save money. You're trying to make more money. That's what arbitration is all about. And basically, you know, to sit there and, 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 you know, across a boardroom table with your agent and all that, and they got the, the, the panel of arbitrators, and then they've got, you know, the, the team's got their representation. And to sit there and watch, you know, your boss motherfuck you and tell you, you know, he can't do this, he can't do that, he sucks at this, he doesn't about that. You're like, fuck you, you piece of shit. You know, that ring you're wearing, you had that ring one for my ass. Um, yeah, so after that arbitration case, I didn't speak to Sherlock the whole year. I mean, he walked by me in the clubhouse. Hey, John, just game face and just keep going. So I didn't, I just like, you know, I, I, I do a pretty good job of holding grudges. And uh, I didn't want to be in Atlanta anymore. Um, you know, just kind of just from that, you know, you, you don't think I'm, I'm worth what, you know, my agent was saying. My agent was, uh, was probably being a little aggressive, uh, asking for the money that we were asking for. Um, but uh, to, to sit there and, and listen to your boss, you know, just, just run you down, you know, was, was, was quite maddening. And so when I got traded, uh, basically just for being an asshole uh, to, to shareholders, um, you know, for the better part, about three or four months, uh, you know, Cleveland, great organization, uh, really enjoyed playing there, great team. You know, we made the playoffs that year. And, and uh, you know, guys like Ellis Burks, uh, CC Sabathia, you know, still, still dear friends to this day. Um, Chuck Finley, you know, uh, Kenny Lofton, Tommy. Um, Robbie Alomar, I mean, the scale, I mean, an awesome team. Um, but as soon as I got up there, uh, I, I was missing home. You know, and it's just one thing to play in the big leagues, but when you get to play for the team that you grew up rooting for, um, you start you, you you take games for that team, you know, very very personally. And you know, remember back when you're you know playing in high school, and you know, I went to the same school for twelve years from first grade through twelfth grade, and so when it came to football games, baseball games against our in town rival, I took that shit personally. Um, well, I played for Atlanta the same way. I've been growing up, you know, as an Atlanta fan, so I'm four years old, uh, you know, going to Fulton County Stadium and listen to Skip Carey and, and, uh, and Pete Van Weeren on, on, uh, uh, AM, AM 680, I think was what it was, or AM 940 on the local making, uh, making station. We're out driving around and, uh, you know, I, I had to listen to and watch so much Braves baseball. And I, I can still remember, you know, where I was when Sid slid in my childhood bedroom, jumping up and down the bed, screaming at my TV. Ryan said, Ryan said, and when they called him safe, I, mean, I just lost it. And uh, so now I get to play for this team. Holy shit. And uh, I, I took those games very, very personally. Um, you know, as if I was playing for my, you know, high school team against my crosstown rival with that Braves uniform on. And I went to Cleveland and I noticed, uh, I won't say I didn't pitch as hard, but I just didn't, I just didn't have the passion uh, in Cleveland. And I can remember. Uh, you know, the first probably month or two I'm there, um, while my Indians are playing outside, I'm in the clubhouse, usually like in, the, in, the, in, the, in the food room, uh, just sitting there on the couch watching the Braves play on TV while I'm getting ready to pitch for Cleveland here in about two hours. Um, you know, missing my buddies, missing home. I uh, just bought a new house, you know, uh, about three or four months before and shit, just buy a new house. I came to live in it, you know, it was, it was kind of pissed. So the organization was great. Um, and uh, I remember John Burkett telling me one time, you know, I was sitting there ranting about, you know, hate Atlanta and Sherholtz and all that stuff. And Burkett's, you know, crafty veteran at that point is like, be careful what you wish for, John. And grass ain't always green on the other side, you know, that, that cliche. And he was right. You know, I, I kind of got my wish of being traded. And when I got there, I'm like, shit, I, uh, I don't really want to be here. Um, I wish I was, you know, still going through the, the battles of my boys. And of course, you know, I was with the organization for like 10 years. And you know, I came up in the minors with Andrew, with Millwood. Um, with uh, Wes Helms, um, Mark DeRosa, uh, you know, O'Dallas Perez, Bruce Chen, you know, all of us were, you know, and you just you get such a bond, such a camaraderie, um, you know, riding buses and rookie ball with guys, riding buses and A ball, and just, you know, the crap you go through as a minor league player. You know, they're, 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 uh, definitely a bond gets formed there. And, um, you know, when you've got those kind of memories and that kind of, you know, tough lifestyle you live for about, you know, four, four and a half, five years. And then you look across the dugout and there's Kevin Millwood and you're, you know, in the NLCS for a World Series. You're like, yeah, I remember you and me and rookie ball that one time, but blah, blah, blah. you know, we eating gas station hot dogs at two o'clock in the morning uh, on, on, a, on a bus ride home from Macon to wherever. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I, just, I, I didn't like Cleveland. But it was kind of a rude awakening that I just didn't uh, didn't didn't have have the uh, have the passion. Um, was did, it better uh, than Texas though? Oh yeah, it was in, in Texas. Um, my problem was in Texas. Uh, it was just a first of all, I was pitching hurt most of the year. 
But uh, the manager Jerry Nair was an absolute fucking clown. I mean, that, that for 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 Tom Hicks to give at that point in time, we were the highest payroll in the big leagues. I mean, it was about almost two hundred million dollar payroll. Um, you know, A Rod at short and uh, Paul Merrill at first, Pudge catching um, Juan Gonzalez and right. I mean, it was just a just you know future Hall of Famers all over the place. And uh, they gave that team to Jerry Nair, and that's, that's the equivalent, in my mind, of giving a brand-new Ferrari to a 16-year-old. Like, what are you thinking? Um, you know, get somebody that's got some – that was his very first man in job. And, and, uh, and butcher it, yeah, he could not have done worse. Um, that you know, doesn't, doesn't – aside from the fact that I just had a shit year. But uh, as I was pitching hurt, and, you know, back then uh, it was, it was um, oh, I don't feel so good. Uh, give me some tore it off, stick it in my ass. Let's go. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not putting myself in DL. And uh, should. I should, mean, I, I played for including the minors, uh, you know, at that point in time, about 12 years, uh, 11 years maybe, and hadn't been on the disabled list for anything, not a stub toe, not a pull of hammy, nothing. And I'm like, I'll be damned if I can go to DL now. And so, just like a hard headed, you know, 27, 28 year old, uh, yeah, I feel like I asked my arms hanging, yeah, give, me, give me some more, give me some more pain bets. Let's go. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not going to the DL. Got, got a, got a ball game win here. So that wasn't the smartest uh, of decisions. I, I remember one, uh, I was reading one article that you said the, or like everybody was on steroids at that time. So of course I was. I mean, they were. And, you know, yeah. when, when, it was when allowed you're, back when then. Yeah. You know, well, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily allowed, but it, uh, it wasn't disallowed either. So, um, and, and, and the, the the front office they they, they knew it. Uh, the coaches knew it. Um, the commissioner's office knew it. And that, that's one thing too. After my old SI stuff, um, you didn't have to submit to a drug test for anything, and um, unless unless you've been arrested, you know, uh, if you've been caught in some other fashion, I've been arrested and they found cocaine on me. Okay, well then the league can test you. Uh, but if you've never been, you know, had, had any issues like that. Then uh, you didn't have to submit to a drug test. You just tell tell the team go shit in your hat. Um, and so they were getting ready to suspend me and all this kind of stuff, you know. And uh, uh, Sealing's office calls my agent. And was like, we want John to take a drug test. I'm like, go oh, fuck yourself. I ain't doing my agent's like, I'm already pretty pissed out. You just take the damn drug test, dude. Well, I failed. I failed it for steroids. Seal didn't, didn't didn't say shit. He didn't, he didn't care. He, 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 you think the only guy in the league? I mean, look at these monsters around here. The only guy in the league, bud. Really. I mean, ceiling new, but you know, asses are in the seats. And you know, four years before, uh, five years before, uh, league went on strike. First time World Series uh, wasn't played since I think World War II. Uh, I mean, ceiling's got some, you know, st- still some PR, some PR problems. And uh, McGuire and Sosa and Bonds were great for the game. The 50, 60 bombs are hitting every year. Uh, yeah, so so of course he knows, you know, what's going on, why it's happening. Uh, so he ain't gonna say shit. And um. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm paid to win ball games. I can't go out there knowing what you know these, these guys are doing uh, that have put on 60 pounds in the last two years and went from hitting 20 home runs a year to hitting 48 home runs a year. Uh, I can't very well go into Bobby after blowing a save. Well, but Bobby, I, I'm sorry. You know, guys, you know, I'm not I'm just, like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, John. Um, here's your plane ticket back to Richmond, and we'll, we'll call you if we need you. I mean, you, you can't do that shit. So uh, I'm not, not going to walk into a, uh, a gunfight with a knife. The, you've been on TV a bunch of times and acting in a couple movies. I found that stat. In 2006, you did the Pros versus Joes. What was that experience like? That was absolutely awesome. I love doing that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I had to get myself back in shape and all that. I, mean, I, I wasn't too far. I think I retired maybe like the year before or something like that. But uh, yeah, I did, did, uh, did three episodes. Um, First, we got Clyde Drexler and um, uh, Rebecca Lobo. I saw her back. I saw Becky on TV this morning. Uh, really, really sweet, uh, sweet girl, uh, which is the damnest thing. Rebecca Lobo is taller than I am. And she, she's got me by like a half an inch. And I'm 6'5". I was like, holy shit, you're really, really tall. Um, and Morton Anderson. Uh, and uh, the last episode I did was a finale. And uh, you go out there, and it was Clyde Drexler. I can't think of who this was. It was two. Two baseball, two basketball, two football. And the two football guys were Kevin Green uh, and and Bill Goldberg. I know Bill forever. Yeah, Bill, Bill, Bill uh, you know Georgia, Georgia guy. Yeah, uh, you know knew him from his playing days in Athens, and uh, lived in Atlanta. And uh, we we actually hung out a good bit uh, back in the day then. And uh, 
So all, all I remember is me and Clyde Drexler sitting you know, off off camera watching an Oklahoma drill with uh, Bill as a down lineman and, and KG as the backer. And these two poor Joes, man, you know, decent sized guys, they're, you know, six foot, 190 pounds. And holy shit. And, and, you know, KG uh, was, was sort of a God squad guy. And when, when you were just with KG, uh, uh, you know, just hanging around and talking, whatever, didn't swear, you know, no dirty jokes, you know, nothing like that. But since he put that uniform on, mother fuck, goddamn fuck, is like, holy shoot, are you, dude? And me and, me and director are sitting there watching this, and man, the ball would get snapped. Bill would just ear hole the, the, the down line of the guys he's facing, his ear hole and slap him pot over tea kettle, would fill one side, and here comes Kevin from about eight yards deep. Oh my God, some of the collisions by the third play. KG's got a cut across his nose, blood coming out of his face. And just, I mean, just blazing red eyeballs. And being direct, like, holy shit, I'm glad we're over here. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was some good, it ended up breaking one kid's arm. One kid went to the hospital um, with, with a broken arm. His week was done. Uh, and then we go back in the clubhouse and Katie's like, this mild mannered KG again, just kind of, you know, just sort of, sort of even tempered, like, holy shit, you can just flip the switch, can't you? So another awesome jersey that I have is a Kenny Powers jersey. If you you know yeah. that shows about you, right? Uh, yeah, you know, lo loosely based. Um, Loose, actually, my, my, loosely, my, my, loosely based. Have my you seen many of it? Uh, I've seen a few. My, my publicist for years was trying to get me a cameo on that show, and just just couldn't do it. Um, here's a stat that'll fucking blow your mind. So you said you know, earlier I was born in Statesboro, Georgia, which is a tiny little nothing town, uh, especially back in 1974. Um, in population of probably 15, 18,000 in little, little towns. And so I was born in the Bullock County Hospital in Statesboro, Georgia in 1974. Um, the guy that plays Kenny Powers, um, what's his name? Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, Danny McBride. Yeah, Danny McBride, thank you. Uh, was born in the Bullock County Hospital in Statesboro, Georgia in 1976. We're born in the same hospital. Cool. Yeah, it's not like Bellevue in New York. This is Bullock County, Georgia, in the seventies. I mean, well, yeah, 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 like 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 twelve births a year in that hospital. Yeah, me and me and me and Danny McBride were the same hospital. Uh, what was your survivor experience like? I've been really wanting to be on the show for a long time. I applied like ten different times. You just ignore uh, me, but uh, I don't, I watched it. I know what don't. happened and all that stuff. But like, what's the actual survivor experience like? Not what happened. Uh, it was a whole lot of the sucks. It was the worst thing I ever done. And they, oh. they they invited they invited me. Um, I'm like, I got a better do. Sure, how bad could it be? And, and from from being on Pros and Joes, I mean, so, so much reality TV is staged. I mean, you literally do retakes, and the producers like, all right, well, say the same thing, you know, but say it like this. I mean, you doing multiple takes. You know, they're cool, trying to create storylines, stuff like that. And after Pros and Joes, I met a girl named Alicia Marie, uh, who was a fitness model. And she had, she had done a couple reality uh, shows with MTV, MTV Made, and a few other ones, and I've been on set for those. And, and again, I mean, reality TV is fake. It's staged. Um, and some Survivor, ah, eh, it's probably the same. Wrong. <laughs> the uh, the camera crew is not allowed to even speak to you. I mean, it was it was like if you went, you know, camera, what what day of the week is it? Wouldn't even respond. Nothing. They, they, they could not, literally could not talk. The, the producers could, in like, interview questions. But other than that, you know, guy holding the boom mic, Who's 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 winning the NBA playoffs right now? Nothing. Game face. You can't even tell me that. No, nothing. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, just one, one easy stat. I mean, I showed up, uh, weighing 245 pounds and 11 days later, I weighed 225. I lost 20 pounds in 11 days. Um, and people think that, that, you know, with the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, little, little competitions you have and, the, um, and the, uh, um, councils, tribal councils at night, they're just next door. Uh-uh, they're not. So. Not only are we on the equ- uh, the equator in July you know, in Nicaragua, but you have to when you go to these these um, you know competition areas, you go to the council stuff like that. You, you got to ride the car for like hour hour and a half, and when you leave the beach, they go get in the car. They have to get three shots. They get the like leaving the beach face, leaving the beach back your head, and then the, the helicopter flies by. Well, where our camp was and where the truck picked us up was about three quarters of a mile. And it's noon. It's 102 degrees out. You've been eating 200 calories a day for the last week. You're already emaciated. And you have to walk that three quarters of a mile. Camera guys are in front of you. You get, you get to the end, turn around, walk back. Then they get the, 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 the shot from behind you. Walk it back down. Turn around, walk back. And the helicopter flies by. Well, so that's uh, what about, about uh, a little over three miles that you had to walk in sand, 102 degree heat, not eating. Every time you left that place, which is pretty much every day. Um, and then to get to the car, it's, you know, it's, it's like a little van or whatever. You've got eight or nine, ten other stinky, smelly, patchouli stinking idiots in there. That none of us have showered in days. We all smell like fucking rotten goats. And they've got all the windows blacked out, including like the front. So you can't see out the front, the sides, back, nothing. Uh, all this blacked out. They try to pump air back there, but it doesn't work. It is, it's probably 105 degrees back there. You're going on these roads that are fucking glorified pig trails. Your 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 heads, you know, you're hitting a bump, and your head slamming against the ceiling of the van. And you're like, oh my god, this sucks. And there, there again, there there are these patchouli stinking people that work for the show. Dreadlocks, pink fingernails, just these these, these you know fucking hippies. And their job is to make sure you don't talk and don't like you know, scheme and formulate plans and strategies and whatnot with your other players while the cameras aren't rolling. So you're, you're, you're not allowed to fucking speak to anybody. You're sitting there in dead silence for that hour, hour and a half ride. They get you out like cattle. They stuff you in some wall tent, nowhere to sit. You're just sitting on the ground. Same thing, sitting there. Guys are obvious, just sitting there. I fucking you just in any kind of just gesture. Someone, you, you, Trump, Trump, we'll send you home. We'll, you, get, you, get, you, get, you get dog cussed by, you know, some dreadlock dope smoking fucking hippie and uh, but of course you can't say anything back or they, they will fucking throw you off the damn show um and then they, they you know, bring you out to the the the, the 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 race or whatever the hell you're gonna do once that's done they stick you back in that wall tent as they break the cameras down you know, so you're in there for like another hour back in that truck back the hour plus to to, uh, to where your camp is and the same thing you did at like noon that day you do it again when you get back you do the face shot back to camp, walk it back, back of the head. So it's, it's about seven miles worth of walking every time you leave that camp in equator heat. And I've eaten 200 calories today. I mean, talking about just a whole lot of sucks. Yeah. So when I got voted off, I'm like, thank God, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, did not. Uh, and when I got voted off, um, you know, put me in a, a, a car front seat with air conditioning this time and took me to about a 15,000 square foot house hanging off a cliff with two vanishing pools and a house staff. Like, yeah, I, I can handle this a little better. And, uh, you know, staff is fixing your drinks and your meals. And, yeah, it was pretty good. So <laughs> I, I like I like that part of Survivor. Let me just say, you don't know who he is personally, but to bring up, they're saying all this stuff that has to do with that article. And what article are you referring to? Well, obviously they know. Get together and vote him out. If, you, if you're a man, I would knock your teeth out. Yeah, Again, always- not so much. I always wondered the behind the scenes stuff, like when the cameras are not rolling and stuff, was there like parties, orgies, did they oh, give you booze? Hell no. no that, the, the la- I was there with my, with my girlfriend. The last yeah, thing Julia. you're thinking about is the last thing you're thinking about is sex. You're like opportunity to sleep with five chicks or a cheeseburger. Take that cheeseburger, baby. Give me that damn cheeseburger. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's one thing about you, you. You've never experienced hunger like that. And you, see, you go through your day, you know, you skip regular. Oh, I'm starting. You know when you're going to eat again. That's that's why, you know, you're not kind of freaking out. Out there, you've never, you're, 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 your stomach's fucking eating your damn backbone. And you have no clue when you're going to eat again. No idea. It may be three days before I eat. I got no idea. 
And then, you know, the, the little bit of food you get, you know, a handful of rice, a coconut, you know, I mean, stuff that's got really no nutritional value and no calories. So as soon as you eat, you're starving, you know, 15 minutes later. Um, you go to sleep like that, you wake up like that, and there's just no end in sight. 40 days, you can kiss my ass. I mean, 11 was enough for me. Yeah. I mean, I uh, I did have Julie on here trying to manifest my way to you. Oh, so. vey. Yeah, yeah we, we can just... I'll save you saying anything there. I'll just move on. She's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, okay, okay I'm not going to shoot that one. Uh What's the immunity idol look like? And you you still got it because you left with an immunity what, what, what idol. Is, what is what 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 is the huh? Uh, oh, immunity yeah. idol. Um, you left no, maybe give it back. I, I try to steal it. Maybe give it back though. Oh, they yeah, they're, very, they're very they're very they're very they're very they're very covetous of all their things. They don't they don't like anybody else to have them. So yeah, maybe 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 give it back. Okay. Um, yeah, that's so how I've got my 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 buff. Which I never, I never heard that word until then, at least not in that context. Um, I would call it a bandana, you know, or a scar. They call it a buff. Um, but uh, I've got that, and that's 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 I got my, my little bathing suit still, you know. Um, but that's it. Okay. Uh, what do you think when fans recognize you out in public and or ask for an autograph on the street? Uh, I love it. It, it. it still happens a lot, um, you know, to this day. I, I do. I do probably. I don't know. Maybe an autograph signing about every two months. Had one in Chicago. Um, so they're inside with Rodman uh, about three weeks ago. Um, and had one this past weekend in Atlanta with uh, me and Pete Smith. I'm sure you remember Pete. Um, but yeah, it, it happens a good bit. You know, grocery stores and and uh, restaurants, stuff like that. So um, I learned from Denny Nagel many years ago. You don't get mad when somebody asks for an autograph. You get mad when they don't. Because that means you're irrelevant. So uh, it's, it's totally fine, you know. Okay. That's awesome. Because I know. I always, for- always appreciate it. I thought I found your address online about a year ago and I sent a package to you in the mail, but I mm-hmm. never came back. So I guess it wasn't the right address. <laughs> yeah. All, all my address are PO boxes. I don't, I don't have anything oh, coming okay. out. Um, did you, you did, did write the book, uh, scars and stripes, right? That did come out. Uh, yeah. That, that came out. God, I don't know. Uh, 2014, I think about, about, yeah, yeah. About 10 years ago, nine years ago, something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, wrote wrote about ninety five percent of it. Um, I had a, a good friend of mine, Jay Marshall Craig, uh, loved. Well, Jeffy passed away uh, this past year, um, but loved Jeffy. But but Jeffy was a uh, um, what well, well, books for for musicians? Uh, he he wrote a, bo- a book for uh, well several books actually for uh, Chuck Lavelle uh, on Brothers and Stones. Um, who Chuck's a Chuck's a making guy too. So I've known Chuck a long time. Um, who else? Uh, Eric Burton of the Animals, um, lead singer Motorhead. I mean, he'd written probably 25, 30 books, all of the, the musical genre. Uh, and I don't know why I thought because of Jeff, Jeff, you look at Jeff and he looks like a writer. I mean, he's eclectic to say the least. Um, and I don't, I don't know why I thought that he could, could write a sports, you know, type book because, uh, we decided we're going to do the project. <clears throat> um, I had to like, you know, sit down and he said he'd never watched a baseball game before. I'm like, huh? Uh, okay. And, you know, sit there, we watched a couple of games. I'm explaining to him stuff. And, and then, uh, he, he writes the first three chapters and I read it. I'm like, there's no way Jeff, you're putting my name on this shit. I'm like, that is fucking awful. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was like, it was, it was, it was written by somebody that only seen two baseball games their whole life. And so, uh, basically took it. I'm like, just, I'll, I'll just write it, Jeffy. Just, just help me do some research and, and things like that, and uh, so that's that's what he did. You know, there's some there's some political talk in there, so he, he helped me research some of that. Uh, he came up with the title. I give him that. He found a publisher, so he he did did contribute. But as far as the actual writing of the book, I, I wrote probably ninety five percent of it. You feel like you've been misunderstood your whole career. Uh, as far as being a kind of a prick, no. Uh, I don't say I'm a prick. I'm just blunt. Um, but as far as being a, a bigot, absolutely. I mean, my, my ex girlfriend we just broke up about a month ago. She's Korean. Um, you know, her, her parents are off the boat Korean, like like mom really can't even speak English. Um, and we, we we dated for a little over three years. Uh, girl I was talking about earlier, Alicia Marie. Uh, we dated for almost four years. She's black um, and not mixed either. I've been hung up with the family a lot. Um, mom from mom from uh, Kentucky, dad from Mississippi. Um, 
And uh, you know, we, we dated for, for a long time. Dated Dennis Martinez. Uh, dated his daughter for, for a while, uh, Erica. They're Nicaraguan. So, um, yeah, as, as far as what Jeff Perlman did, that angle he took on that, uh, yeah, um, uh, what a fucking joke. I mean, you have dated a lot of hotties. I mean, you had, you had that Jennifer Kennedy, I think, too. Oh, uh, she was the worst. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that kind of, yeah, don't, don't, uh, she was a, she was a Okay, we don't need to talk about exes. Uh, no, she was not, not the best. Yeah. If you could get rid of one state in the United States, what would it be? California. Yeah, I'm kind of, I love California, though. People, maybe. All those, all those fucking hippie shitheads out there. Except for, like, like Orange County. You know, San Diego County. Um, one state. Uh, there, there's, there's, there's good stuff about every state, you know. Um, okay. yeah, I hate New York, but I, I love going. I, I can take it in small doses, you know, three, four, five days. But I, I love going up there. It's, it's fun for a minute. Um, you know, I think there's a few cities we could do without. You know, Chicago could probably do without that place. Uh, yeah, it is. It is windy for a reason. Well, it's also the murder capital of the world, yeah. but uh. So, but yeah, I, I don't. I don't think I, I, I dump any of them. I was just out in California um, a few months ago with Tom. So, uh, yeah, good, good, uh, good, good parts of every state, but also yeah, bad parts of them too. True. Uh, you're a proud conservative. Uh, what's wrong with your country? I mean, I live in Canada, so it's like living above a crack house. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, just just a lot. Um, liberalism run them up you know uh that's that's uh that's probably the start and end of it honey you can say what you want to about trump trump kind of a prick too um but holy shit that, that guy this that is country humming you know and, and, and you're looking in just two years of biden uh you know what's going on at the border all the drugs are just rampantly flowing through here um uh you know inflation through the roof i mean you're, you're paying you know, nine, ten bucks for a carton of eggs now. I mean, like, just goddamn, man. Uh, yeah, just a very expensive place to live. Where two years ago, what? So, uh, I, I think the the main main problem in this country is just liberalism run amok. And if you're in a if, if you're a liberal, who are listening is is a liberal, you can go fuck yourself. Okay. The uh, what do you think of the new rules in baseball? Like the pitch clock. I, 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 I wasn't a huge fan. Uh, you know, because the, the, I am I am kind of a purist when it comes to the game. Um, not a huge fan. It's growing on me a little bit. The pitch clock I do not like. Uh, they, they, they need to do something. You know, there's certain situations, man. You can't, you just can't rush them. And if, if you're, you know, some Gen Z loaf in the stands and game's going too long, get out and fucking leave, man. You know, nobody's forcing you to stay the whole goddamn game. Um, leave. Uh, but now the 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 the, the, the throwing over that, that's absolutely just utterly ridiculous. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to to pump up scores and, and make 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 scoring you know more prevalent. Um, you know, you want to do that? Just reintroduce steroids. <laughs> I have a lot more guys yeah, right. hitting, hitting hitting bombs. But uh, um, but yeah, I've, I've never been a big a big Manford fan. I mean, he was. Uh, I don't know what his job was at Commissioner's Office back when I was playing, but I met him you know, many, 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 many years ago. Um, didn't really have an opinion of him. Uh, you know what he's doing now. Uh, it is having you know, the intended effect. Uh, but you know, at, at what cost to the players? Um, the larger bases. All right, so you're helping your guy out by three inches a side. You know, is that is that really that big a deal? Um, the pitch clock. Not a huge fan. The the mandatory you know throw over kind of stuff. Uh, the shift stuff, um, you know, it can kind of go either way. You know, my opinion is if, if they're going to throw the shift on you, uh, learn to hit the ball the other way. I mean, pretty, pretty simple. Um, you know, we, you know, when a guy introduced to the league, uh, you look at like Austin Riley, you know, was it three, four, five years ago? He, he comes in the league and just tearing it up. I mean, he's, you know, 330 his first two or three months. Second time to the league, not so much. Uh, and then he, he, he breaks camp with the team uh, his second year. And he ends up getting sent down to AAA. I mean, the, the, the scout report you know, got out on him, and pitchers made their adjustments, defense made its adjustments, and if he couldn't adjust to their adjustments, uh, he, he never would have gotten back. But he, you know, makes makes his adjustments, gets back, and obviously is having a tremendous career. But that, that's just kind of how baseball goes. I mean, when people adjust to you, you're forced to you know counter adjust to their adjustments. Uh, I mean, a shift is just just part of playing the game. Uh, if you're that just dead pool guy, get in the fucking cage. 
with, with your, your 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 hitting coordinator, and let's let's learn to hit the ball the other way and, and put it in practice during the game. You know, don't don't. That's one thing you're frustrating about Andrew. Um, you know, that, that was the way to get Andrew out, uh, especially from from a, from a right-handed pitcher's uh, perspective. Uh, fastballs out of third and sliders, and, and Andrew would sit in in uh, in the tunnel day after day after day after day and work on going the other way, go the other way, go the other way, go the other way. BP, same thing. Get in the game, first slider he sees, rolls over the shortstop. Like, Jesus, Andrew, you take 75 swings a day working, keeping your hands inside the ball, shooting the ball to right field. First fastball you see away, you're trying to yank that so much over them left field wall, and, you know, you hit a drill back to the pitcher. I mean, adjust, dude. And, um, you know, again, if you if you'd miss, he'd make you pay. But, but that's that, that that's sort of my, my feeling on that. Uh, you know, you, you look around the league, and people say, oh, we don't big, big, big league pitch anymore. There was like, I think, 15 teams, 14 teams, something like that last year that hit under 240 as a team, which I was like, holy shit. Um, I think the first time a team hit under 240 in the history of the league was like in 2008. Um, I think the average team batting average in like 98, 99 was like 270. That was average, 260, 270, something like that. And so when you think about half the league is hitting under 240 as a team, you're like, good God. But a lot of that was because of the shift. I mean, you can still watch, you know, watch, uh, you know, highlights now and, uh, you know, ground balls up the middle are going for base hits now. Whereas, you know, last two or three years, that'd be an out to your fucking third baseman, uh, you know, playing right behind second. Um, so you, you will start seeing more, you know, more scoring and averages go up because, you know, if you've done a good job and stayed inside the ball and took it back up the middle, um, that was an out. That was a, that was a, a five, three, uh, you know, the last couple of years. Now it's going to be a single up the middle, which I, I agree with that. You know, if you do a good job as a hitter and, and, you know, hit the ball back up the middle is what uh, is, is the, the philosophy and the strategy of a lot of hitting coaches and a lot of hitters. They want to stay inside the ball and sit right back up the box. Um, you know, back last couple of years, that's going to be an out. So, uh, I do, you know, in that respect, agree with it. Um, but in the other respect, if a, uh, if the league is adjusted to you, then you adjust back to them and learn to go the other way. You know, learn to, you know, just just you- play pepper with the ball. I just it just hit a a five hopper to the left side of the infield where the third baseman would be, and he got you a little easy single there. It's not just trying to rip the ball through the right side of the infield. Where there's four damn defenders over there. So do you, do you events with like the alumni of the Braves, or is there something like that going on? Uh, yeah, I do do uh, do events with the team. Uh, we, we do alumni weekend um, once uh, once a year, three days, little, little, little three day weekend. Um, usually in August, so uh, do that. And we're tired. Andrew's jersey is getting retired in September, I think the ninth, I believe. So I'm sure I'll be in Atlanta for that. Um, so yeah, do, do, do some stuff like that. And you know, of course, autograph signing. That was I was Pete Smith this past weekend. Uh, we had another one in Atlanta, January, I think. Wes Helms was there. Um, I'm trying to think who else was there from Atlanta. Uh, local guys, Wolves was there. Uh, Keith Lockhart was there. Lemke was there. So I, I, I got I to see these guys. Piece of Klesko was there. So I guess these guys, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty often. Okay. Uh, what's new with you now? Final question. What are you doing these days? You know, just, just, uh, you know, traveling the country with, uh, with the MPA doing camps. Um, you know, got a lot of lessons to do down here. So I never, never thought I would enjoy doing it. Um, Johnny Estrada, uh, you know, brace catcher, dear friend of mine. And, uh, what was it? Maybe 2016 or something. I don't know. 15, 16 was just nagging me and nagging me and nagging me. Come out work with a couple of his kids. And I'm like, why, wow, Johnny? It didn't, doesn't pay anything. I don't really want to do that. And so after maybe, I don't know, half a dozen invites, I'm like, fine, Johnny, I'll come up with your kids. I'm like, don't give me, you know, well, these kids can't figure out which hand to put the glove on. Uh, I want some kids that, that, you know, have got a, got a, you know, got an idea. And, um, so I went with a couple of his kids and after about the second or third lesson, I'm like, I really enjoy doing this shit. It kind of fires me up a little bit. Um, so doing that and I bought into a, a supplement company, um, a few months ago. So just, just, you know, doing, doing some stuff like that called Biogenics USA. Uh, it's basically uh, an- anti-aging products, uh, natural, natural test boosters, telomere support, um, you know, improving heart health, you know, lowering A1Cs, cholesterols, body fat, stuff like that. And a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic day of products. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. And, and, uh, trying to play some golf. So. Okay. How's your handicap? Well, uh, I've only played four times this year because once deer season starts in about October, I put the I put the clubs down. Uh, I'm deer hunting about four or five days a week, so 
I usually do that until until the season's over. And so right now we're trying to you know get get tuned back up. Um, I played a course. I played a course called uh, Burnt Pine down here a lot. Real nice course. And I uh, shot a forty one on the front nine uh, last Saturday. And the back nine, I stopped keeping score. I'm like fuck this. It was oh, just one, one of those. So, yeah, so it's it's either all or nothing. You know, I was I was you know well, five over in the front nine, and then the back. Well, there there was like a twenty five mile an hour wind, and, and most of the holes are just right in the teeth of that wind. So, um, yeah, back back nine about the third or fourth hole, I just just stop 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 keeping score. Just put the pencil down. That is only one though. So that, that happens um, to the that happens to the best of us. You know, by the back yeah. nine, I'm already nine beer in. If you're yeah, I don't. I don't drink when I play. I have a hard enough time playing sober. But yeah, I'm, I'm 48 years old now, so you know that that back nine, the back back's barking at you a little bit. The knees are barking at you, and uh, you have a hard time. You know, hard time turning on the ball. And, you know, those 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 straight shots uh, and then shots with draw or turning a snap hooks because you just you just can't get your hips for you know your, your back back's too sore, knees are too too achy, too creaky. So uh, you know. Perfect. I'd, I want to thank you for giving me your time. And, you know, I'm a big fan of you for many years. And I'm just so glad that I got the chance to manifest this and get you on here to talk about your career.